and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure uh, to have the honor to introduce to you our uh, guest, Raymond Laflamme from Waterloo, not in Belgium, but in Ontario, Canada. And I will tell you that he's one of the few people who does theory of experiments himself. He did uh, research in the UK working on black holes in four plus one dimension with Stephen Hawking. Experimental. Experimental, Experimental yes. of course, yes. <laughs> then he moved to the US, worked with uh, Wojciech Szurek in Los Alamos. Now for more than 10 years he's in Canada. He worked uh, to create first the Perimeter Institute, later Institute of Quantum Computing, and now he is a director, uh, executive director of this institute. And he will tell us something about testing born rules. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, very much. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. And I, again, thanks, Carol, for organizing my visit to Poland this time. I came here about 25 years ago as a student, and I came and see that things have changed quite a lot, certainly on the surrounding and other things. But the warmth of the hospitality has not changed. And so, great pleasure to be here. And today I'm going to talk about testing board rules, but before I go, I'll make a little advertisement for the Institute for Quantum Computing. It's an institute which started in 2002. It's about a $350 million uh, program in Canada for quantum information with the goal of de developing quantum information science and technology. The size of the institute is 22 faculty who are working solely on quantum information science with about 45 postdocs, 160 students, with some staff that makes about an institute, about 200 people together working on developing quantum information science. Uh, we collaborate with quite a lot of people. If you don't know where is the Waterloo of Canada, then the one from Belgium, it's kind of about 100 kilometers west of Toronto. We have a series of programs here, students, postdocs, research assistant, associate faculty, faculty. We have a lot of program for undergrad students. We have a program called USQIP, Undergrad Summer School in Experimental Quantum Information. So if you are an undergrad here, or if you do have undergrad, please go to this website, like you see that you are that CA, and you can learn about it. We bring about 20 undergrad students every year for two weeks. And we, ex we don't expect the undergrad to learn much, to know much about quantum information when they come. But when they leave, they'll have done a few experiments in quantum information science with a few quantum bits. We have a program for uh, graduate students, summer schools, conference for graduate students. We also have a program for postdocs in the fall called Quantum Innovators. So a lot of different activities are happening. And so if you're a faculty here, advertise this to your students and postdocs so that you can uh, come here. The work at the Institute has part which is very fundamental things like testing board's rule that I will mention, trying to understand quantum mechanics, trying to understand its limits, its properties, but also developing the science, the mathematics, the science, the engineering, ground information, and we also have a program of commercializing some of the output that comes out of this research. And although most people think that quantum computing is very far away that before we get, we will get quantum computers, which is partly true, it will take some time before we have workable quantum computers on the large scale. But there are things today that comes out of quantum information science that can reach the market. And here is a small but company that I started. Your institute is located in Canada. Are you in any sense associated or you can comment on the current controversy of delay computing? Okay. We can, and let's come back on the uh, question time. You can ask that but question. That relates to the question whether the quantum is far away, available, or it's a, it's, so, a it's a complicated market operation. And absolutely, and I've made my statement that quantum computers are still far away, so you can probably find <laughs> out <laughs> what, what, I, what I will say in the question period, but this can kind of go very sideways on, on this so part. I'm I'm you are not, the, the Institute is not associated with the way computers. It is not. Um, but we do have pieces which can be commercialized out of the quantum information. Here's a small company called Universal Quantum Devices, which does time tagging devices for photonic experiments to be sure that if we have correlated photon, untangled photons, and we want to correlate two of them goes in different distance, you need very good clock, you need tagging devices, and this is one of the output, and there's a few more that comes out. 
that you can learn about. So, wide range of things that we do at the Institute. And today I'm going to focus on one of them, the very fundamental part. And Christoph, uh, sorry, Carol asked me to talk about this work that I've been doing for, uh, with some colleagues for some time ago on testing Born's rule. And then I'll come back in a few minutes on uh, how this, this came about. But, um, well, maybe I can tell the story a little bit of how the, this work on testing board rules came about. I had a group at IQC that we, where we do, as I said, science, but we also do outreach for the public. And I wanted to have a source of single photons, which we could do a single photon experiment and see the interference pattern coming out of single photon that people who are walking down the street could be able to see with their own eyes that this is really happening. So we built a single photon source. And we have a postdoc, a postdoc, Christoph Kuto, who was working on this. And when he got the source working, he said, why do we do this outreach stuff? Let's do some piece of interesting science with this source. So I said, do you have any suggestion? He says, yeah. I heard there was an experiment with three slit that nobody has done, to which I scratched my head and I said, we're in, at the time we were in 2008 or 2009, I said, the two-slit experiments is well known to everybody. And having a three-slit experiment should have been done years and years ago. And he said, oh, I don't know. I don't think, I think this is something new. So that morning I was at IQC working with Christoph. In the afternoon I went to the Perimeter Institute, which is about uh, a kilometer and a half from the Institute for Quantum Computing, and bumped into a friend of mine, Faye Dauker, who was a student in Cambridge at the same time as me, and Raphael Sorkin. And they asked me what I was doing, and I mentioned different things. And I mentioned this three-step experiment, saying, oh, I have this postdoc who wants to do a three-step experiment. I don't know what it is. And Raphael Sorkin said to me, oh, I suggested that experiment. So I was very, very surprised. <laughs> I said, good, so then you can tell me what it is about. And this is what I'm going to tell you about today. What is this three-step experiment? And how does it test Born's rule? So, on this, what is Born's rule? So, it is one of the postulates of quantum mechanics. So here's the usual five postulates of quantum mechanics that you learn when you go and take a course in quantum mechanics. The first one, states are represented by vectors in the Hilbert space. So, this thing is all tight. Yes? I'm a bit confused. Uh, there is something so like an interference mass. It's great, right? They have many rows. So I believe that the experiment which there the rule is always more than two slits experiment. Well, you can do experiments with two slits and no, uh, but two people slits have done more more than, more than two I'm slits. About it oh, yeah. So if you wait a little bit you'll see what is interesting with three slits. So be a little bit of patience, I'll get, I'll get back to this. So states are represented by vectors in the Hilbert space. Evolutions are represented by unity or operators. And then after a measurement, then you, if you measure again, you measure exactly the same thing that you've measured on the first thing. Third person of the quantum mechanics. Number four, outcome corresponding to eigenstate of the measured observables. And then only one of them is detected. So we don't measure the whole wave function, but only a component which are related to what we are measuring. We're measuring the eigenstate of a partner operator, and the Born's rule comes in and tells us that the probability of observing the eigenstate psi k comes in at the modulus of square of this partner eigenstate. Okay? So the Born rule is that if I give you a wave function, I'd expand it in terms of the eigenstate of a measuring operator, the coefficient psi k of this will give you modulus squared is the probability of measuring that particular result. And it is this that we're going to test. Okay? Now you might say, why are we interested in this? Well, quantum mechanics works pretty well. It works very well, as you have mentioned. So it must be pretty good. It must be pretty much psi squared. But maybe there's two possibilities in the future of quantum mechanics. Either it is the final theory that we have arrived at in 2000, the year or from 1926 up to today, 
And that's it. It's exactly a square, and that's it. The rest of most of you doing theoretical physics is just pushing that theory of quantum mechanics. There's another option that maybe quantum mechanics is not a final theory. And some pieces of these action, axioms are not going to be right. And the interest to me is to try to find, is there a limit to quantum mechanics? Is there places where it fails in looking for different places? And when you do this research, there's a chance of failure that maybe we will not find violations of quantum mechanics. But if we, if we go to the other side, if we find some violation of quantum mechanics, it would be truly revolutionary. But we already know that some of the axioms are not totally right, because this axiom number four is inconsistent of this, that when you measure, the evolution is not unitary. So we already know that there's something that really don't, we don't really understand the foundation of quantum mechanics. So we can question this assumption. But here is the one that I'm going to work on or talk about most during this talk today. So sometimes when I talk to people about the Born's rule, people say to me, it's obvious, it has to be psi squared. It is trivial. Well, to me, it is trivial in the sense that this is what we learn. But it is really an axiom of quantum mechanics. And if you go back and look at the paper by Born, in 1926, when he mentioned Born's rule, there's a few interesting things out of the paper. The first one is there's a little postscript on the first page, a little star, which says that this paper, due to the length of this paper, it couldn't be published in Nature of Shaft, which is the equivalent of Nature today. But when you look at the length of the paper, it's three or four pages. So it's definitely not the length. It's probably some referees who kind of threw out that paper because they didn't like it for one reason or the other. And this is a message for the young people here. If you get the paper re rejected by nature, it's not the end of your career. Sometimes it's maybe because you're a little bit too evolutionary and the traditional <coughs> nature referees might not like it. And it turns out that this was truly important for quantum mechanics. Now you start to read uh, the, the paper and then you go there the, the, the phi here is really the psi of the previous page, which is the wave function. And it says, if one translates this result into terms of particles, only one interpretation is possible. Only one interpretation is possible. Phi gives the probability. And then there's a lesser risk, which is addition in proof. More careful consideration shows that the probability is proportional to the square of that quantity. <laughs> So it already tells you that it was not totally trivial, that kind of in quantum mechanics from one more. No absolute value, no. It's what? No absolute value so far. So far, it's so far. <laughs> that's it. So uh, no absolute value in there. It's 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 that's it. <laughs> and you got a Nobel Prize related to that work. So you can show that you can have things which are not totally right and still have some incredible insight in the world in which we live. So in his Nobel, uh, Nobel lecture in 54, Born says, again, an idea of Einstein gave me the lead. He had tried to make the duality of particles, like quantum or photon, and, wave compre and waves comprehensible by interpreting a square of the oblique wave amplitude as a probability density for the occurrence of photon. This concept could at once be carried over to psi function. And there, yes, the modulus of psi square. So it was slow, but it's, he got the right answer in the end, after a few trials, all to represent the probability density of electrons or the particle. It was easy to assert this, but how can it be proved? And so, I don't think you can prove it. I think you can do experiments and verify that this agrees with experiments. And this is the story of this talk. So, I'm going to talk about a way of generalizing interference in a theory which would generalize quantum mechanics and see but how... What do you consider to be a proof other than the experiments which, which agree with this possibility? That's exactly what I said. No, no, no. You can prove that square, one of the square of size squared has all of size has all pro mathematical properties of probability density. But it you can, can be normalized, it's real, it's, 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 it's 
If this is equal to zero, then there's nothing to talk about, and then we can go for a cup of coffee or a beer. Now, the second, uh, the first sum rules, okay, is the difference as the one that we've saw, which really tells you that quantum mechanics, in that sense, for a single object, is different than what we see in the classical theory. Now we can define a third one, which is now we have three paths, and then we can define it as the sum of the probability of the three sets open minus the probability of two sets open plus the sum of two slits being closed and only one open. Okay. And it turns out that if you look at this in quantum mechanics, you get something which is equal to zero. So again, I'm going to do this explicitly because it's really at the basis. So we have two prob probabilities, psi A plus psi B plus psi C. We square this, so you get these three terms, and then the interference term that we had previously. So this is the probability of A plus B plus C. And remember that IAB is equal to PAB minus PA minus PB. I put this all together, and what I get is that the probability of A, B, and C is equal to the probability of AB plus probability of AC plus probability of BC. And by AB, I really mean that A and B are open, and I close C. Probability of AC is that probability of A and C and disclosed, and then minus probability of A, B, and C when two of those are closed. Okay? And then quantum mechanics tells you that if we have a square here, that this is exactly equal to this. So the third order interference, this term here, is equal to zero. And in order to have a third order term not equal to zero, you would have to change the square there. Okay? So we know from experiments that things here cannot be that different from square because everything would go to L. Experiments that we do, things that we see in the world would be very different, but we don't know how well it is the square. Maybe it's square plus some epsilon, or maybe the function is, not, is different than this, but on the energy at which we are able to reach, or the scale we are able to reach, where just kind of square is a really good approximation. Like, we know that the harmonic oscillator is a good approximation in many, many places, but if you go and push a little bit, sometimes you find a little bit of a cubic term that comes in. And this is what we're interested to look at. Okay. So, if we have a term here which is not square, then suddenly this minus these terms plus these terms is not equal to zero. And this is what the three step experiments is about is just go and measure this. Now, you might say, why can you do, not do this with only two slits? Because if you have only two slits, the probability will be psi A plus psi B, and if you go and measure this very carefully, the pattern of the two slits, you will see a deviation. So, suppose that you have only slits A and B, we look at a pattern here, which looks like this, and then if you measure this, you will see if PAB is proportional to Psi A plus Psi B squared. Now, the reason why people didn't go and do this and look at the square is that the pattern that you get here depends on what is the wavelength of the light, you need to know it very precisely. You need to know this very well, and small disturbance in there or imperfect slits kind of make uh, the system, make this looks appear slightly differently. Or maybe if you don't know the distance here or the distance here. So there's a lot of parameters that kind of, if they are a little bit imprecise, would look like a change of square if you would not look at it very carefully. But here, this is pretty robust. It doesn't depend on the distance of the slit. It doesn't depend on the precision of the slit. It depends only that you have three wave, three alternatives, and you have the square there. So that's the reason why this is interesting to go and look at this part of experiments compared to those to test virtual. Well, that doesn't get the things right. I mean, this is. What you are saying is that there is not a third order, I mean, the, the, the third which is, the term which is free linear in, in amplitudes in this expression. Yeah. Clearly, because there is a square and not the third power or yeah. another power, right? Yeah. So, 
So, so if you go to the four sleep experiment, five sleep experiment, it's going to be the same. You will never see the term which is of the third order. It's a, a free, free linear term. It's a really good comment that you have, and I should have mentioned it here. So there is a generalization of these terms here. So here I have the third order interval, the second order interference. There'll be a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one in principle. If one is equal to zero, all the higher order one will be equal to zero. So for quantum mechanics, this one is equal to zero, and all the other ones are zero. But now, if I have, instead of a square here, let's say I have a small alpha, then these terms will come and, and get it there. So thank you very much. It was a very good, very, very good comment. OK. So here's the idea of what we're going to do in the experiment. Instead of doing one experiment and measuring this incredibly well, we're going to do a series of experiments and add these probabilities together. So the first experiment is the three slits open. So you can think about this as a three slit. Then we're going to block one. We're going to block the other one, block the third one, block two, and block three. Now, here's, I think, except for Conrad, most people here are theorists. In the previous slide, I had only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven terms. But here, I have a eight term. Why is that? So the theoreticians, my friends the theoreticians, and Raphael Sorkin in particular says, we don't need to do this. You're going to see nothing if you block all the slits. Exactly what you want to see. Now, the problem is that when you block all of this, Conrad will tell you that you do see something in your detectors. Because there are dark counts. Okay? And if you look at this, the dark counts of this one can be compensated by that one because you have here a minus and a plus, a minus and a plus, a minus and a plus. So the dark counts here compensate each other. But if you don't have this term, you have the dark counts from this. So your third order of difference will not be zero. And then we've learned this in a naive way by realize that bloody hell, we're violating quantum mechanics <laughs> <laughs> on the first experiments. But in a careful, after a few minutes, we realize, OK, we have to add this thing. In the, so which is one moral of this experiment? When you try to do something that gives you zero also, you have to be incredibly careful when you do experiments. Small systematic or errors kind of come and do this. And then you have errors. So I mentioned to you that it is better to do this type of experiments than the one where you measure the problem of the size squared very precisely because it's more robust. But there's still things which are not as robust by doing eight experiments instead of one. Because the assumption here that comes in there is that the condition, except for having the slits being open or closed, the conditions are exactly the same thing. And you know very well that in the lab, right now, or if you do the same experiments in an hour, you won't get exactly the same results. So you have to take care of this, and which tells you that the epsilon will not probably be equal to zero, but you have to understand all the pieces of error that comes one after the other. Yeah? But those dark counts are what terrible or condition? I mean, these are just containers, uh, generations of the electron holders, but you see it in your cover as assumption that these are uncorrelated with incident photons, which is a pretty strong assumption for a real life. And, and, and you're right. So we have to go analyze a lot of these things, one of them. And I also made the comment that when you close these two, the dark counts should be roughly the same as if you have things all closed, and which is not obvious. And then we will get at the end a value of epsilon. You will be happy to know that it's not too large, so it's consistent with many experiments, but we cannot still claim that we're, this corresponds to a violation of quantum mechanics. If we can only put a bound in quantum mechanics. Now, second thing is that when you go and measure this, and if you indeed have fluctuation and dark count, as you wait longer and longer, it's not clear that this is going to shrink, increase, or whatever it's going to do. And at the end, you'll get a number. And if I give you that the number is 42, 
you will not know exactly what it means. So we have to compare it to something. And then we had quite a lot of debate on what it, are we supposed to correspond to to uh, to uh, compare it to. And what we've compared it to is, in some sense, the two-piece interference that we have. So the the first order interference term, okay, gives us a value of how quantum mechanics violates the classical addition, probably the additions. And then we want to know how the second order interference compares to that. So this is the value that we have, we call this delta. And what I'm gonna plot is the rho is the epsilon divided by the delta. So they might, we had ideas that maybe we should compare it to something else. Uh, you can go and look back at the data we had, and you can go and compare it if you want, but this gives you an idea of what we had, and I, we thought it was a reasonable measure of the, the rule. Um, so, now we go and go and do this. And when I first heard about this experiment, I asked one of the postdocs at IQC, or Brasil to Sina, to go and do the experiment, and I thought, Everybody, all of you must have seen the two-slit experiments, right? Anybody saw it experimentally at the single photon level? Good. One. Anybody else? So then shame on all of you who haven't seen it because it, it's supposed to be, or in the year 2000, it was declared as the most, one of the top 10 most beautiful experiments in physics. And I can see in the room here only one person has seen it. Turns out that it's not that easy to see it at the single photon level. So it takes a little bit of work to do it very well. And I thought it was going to be really easy or to make it happen. You have a source of single photons, you just put it to slits and you measure it. And it turns out that it was not that easy. And in part because the wavelength that we had was around 800 nanometer. So which means that the slits, so we have three slits here, to have some kind of interference pattern, you need to know that the distance here and the distance between the states all have to be orders of nanometer, uh, of about a micron. And then you start to think, okay, if the distance between this and this is about one micron, and you want to go and block some of these sets. It's pretty easy to block this one by bringing something from here and put it down. And so you can have something which is relatively big. You can have something from here to block it. But to block the one in the middle turned out to be quite hard kind of doing it well, because if you don't do it well, then suddenly you're violating some part of the assumption of uh, the experiments, that all these experiments are independent from each other, and you get an epsilon, which kind of <coughs> seems to be non-zero. So it turns out that we have needed to, be, to have three iterations of how to kind of block this, and to how to do this. And at the end, what we did is, uh, we first initially tried to block things in certain way in this way, but the best way we found was to make a system with the slits being open, and then have a mask of a material which would go up and down, and which will make these openings. So we had a mask which was a bit like my hand, and then with kind of a little slit like this, and the slit pattern was in front, and these holes here would be big enough so that the light would come, not being affected. And if it's near enough, then suddenly you can make them go up and down and then have always the same length of the, the slits. Because if you change the size of the slit for a certain amount of time that you are doing the experiments, you'll have the same number of counts. So we have a mask, okay, which comes out of the blackboard, goes up and down. And with this, we can uh, open and close all of this. The first mask that we did, we did this homemade at IQC in a fabrication facility, and it turns out that when it was going to block this, it still had about 5% spurious transmission. 5% spurious transmission is not good for the experiments that we do. It gives us some epsilon, which is quite large, so it's very sensitive to uh, transmission of light. There. Then we have a mask made of chromium and about 3% spurious transmission, still too bad. And so it didn't work very well. And then I see uh, Conrad saying yes, because he's probably seen some of this and saying this, but 
I was not a quantum optics person doing experiments, so definitely a bit naive at the beginning. But I think we learned that with an aluminum partial mass was good enough, about 0.1% transmission. And it turns out that with this, it was not the dominant error that we have, and we'll go back and look at the, uh, the errors in a few minutes. Okay. I should also mention that when we do the experiments, there's a, we had a single photon, we did this with a laser at relatively high intensity, roughly in the classical regime, single photon, uh, uh, low intensity lasers, and then single photon detection. So single photon sources that comes in there. So we have these three sources that we can use and compare the different values of what we would get for the second order interference. We cannot do the experiments for too long, because if you do the experiments, it's too long, just temperature gradients, kind of variation of the system, with the system, so you are limited a certain amount. So when you go to the single photon, because the source is not, the, that we had was not deterministic, then there is a distribution of errors in the source also, which leads to an effective violation of this epsilon or third order interference. So here is what the, 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 the experiment looks like. A laser comes in, then we have a beam splitter here, which measure the intensity of that laser or the, of the light that will go through. So we can normalize the result here, depending on what, what is the amount of, uh, kind of the, the counts or the power that comes out of here. And then we have the three slits, and we have the mask and the opening that are on that side here. Ideally, we would like to have this mask to really rub against the slits that we have. But if we do this, it sticks and then kind of screw up the system that we have. So they had to be a little bit of a distance from each other, and we could see the effect of this. And by numerical simulation, we could see that indeed the, 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 the error in the epsilon that we had on the row was in part due to some of the distance that we have in here. Here's the, the detail a little bit more with the laser. This is for the single photon sources. The single photon sources are created in here. The two of them come here. We count one, we count one of them, or we calculate the, the, the source in here. So the, the two photon comes here. One, minute, uh, one comes in here, which is paralyzed, and tangled photons we measure here. And depending on when this one measure, we measure to be sure that we have a single photon sources by using what is called the G2 measurement in here. Here's what the very relatively simple optical table element, laser in the sphere, down conversion to rate the entangled photons. They both come here, one goes here, and depending on when this one click, we have a measurement here of a single photon. And here's what we see when we send not the single photon, but the, a, a laser pulse. Okay? All, all the uh, the set closed, looks very flat. We open the one totally on the right. You see, oops. I think I have the thing which is inverted in here. This one should be there and this one should be there. So we have indeed three patterns which looks similar to each other, but you can see it's not exactly the same because the slits here don't have exactly the same shape. But we know it doesn't matter. Even though the slits are slightly different in size or not, it doesn't matter, it's the sum of all these patterns which we care about. Now here's the two slit experiments with the laser pulse. Here's the one with the slits opposite from each other. As you increase the distance, you see a lot more of these interference patterns in the wiggle. Here and here should be exactly very similar to this one. And then the three slit pattern looks like something in here. So when we went to measure this value of rho or epsilon, then we have to decide where, where we're going to be. We could measure it at all the different points, but that becomes very time consuming. So what we did is we look at the maximum value of this first order interference, and it turns out it's around the position zero in here. So we put our detector there, and we go and measure. So here's the result that we have. So we have kappa, which turns out to be the same as the rho that I mentioned before. When we have a laser in power, so high power, very similar to classical system. And then we have a value of 0 0.0073, okay? So this is the value of 
essentially this that we would have to, uh, to put in there. When you have laser with low intensity, with photon counting, then you can realize that some of the fluctuation comes in, and in part comes in because the number of photons that comes in for the eight different experiments is different. So you see a slightly bigger fluctuation than what we had in there. And here's with single photon sources, you can see the higher number of fluctuation, and again, it's the number of photons that comes in, which is one of the dominant sources that we have in here. And here's the different values that we have, and then we can add it. So any systematic error that produced non-zero, oh, I don't know what it is, must have the different combination differently. Okay, so if we have an error which makes one of these eight experiments a little bit different, it brings a different value of epsilon. So this is the kind of thing that we have to track down when we do this. Um, the irregularity of the slits, well, we already know that this doesn't matter. So the slits can be very different from each other. It doesn't matter because the wave function is psi a plus psi b plus psi c squared, whatever the values of the psi a, b, or c, doesn't matter. Spurious uh, mass transmission and misalignment. Uh, we solved that problem by going and looking at the, the, this mask that brings it into different directions. Then we have to worry about parts like the power drift, the fluctuation of the laser, the fiber couplings, the fiber parallel effect between the mask and the slit. Mm -hmm. This is what I mentioned. If the mask and the slits are not next to each other, light kind of moves a little bit from the sides, and then this affects and we did numerical simulation, and indeed, you can see a little piece of this. Bim shape detector stability as a function of time, non-linearity of the detectors. If the detectors are not linear, you'll see the square there being different, and we could see this if we kind of have high intensity that comes in the detector, you can see the effect there. But we did independently look at the stability of the detectors and the linearity of the detector in the range that we looked at. In homogeneous mass tra transmission, at different place of the mask, the transmission might be slightly different. So that leads to quite a lot of, um, of things. And indeed, uh, detector limitation is what I mentioned again. We have to go and look at this in detail. And then we can find at the end that the laser source of photons, we do not expect it to get a value of rho which is closer to 0 than 0 0.01. Because of the detectors that we have, we just kind of this is the limit of the apparatus that we have. And so if we have something which is about this, probably means that it, it is in agreement with quantum mechanics and we have not a positive source or detection of something which would be different than quantum mechanics. Uh, could, you, could you show the distribution of this in the case of single photon? Uh, two slides back, or maybe three slides, one this one? Um, the uh, next one. The distribution of... Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think about this distribution at the bottom right panel? I mean, it doesn't look as a nice Gaussian distribution. Uh, mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, I don't uh, oppose the mean value, but the error estimation uh, so, which you probably got from... It should be a, a, a Gaussian distribution, right? But it doesn't look very much. Yeah, but the counts are not incredibly large also in the counts. Yeah, sure, but what I'm saying is that maybe you could carry your experiment for a longer time. To carry it. Okay, this is a very, very good theoretical uh, <laughs> suggestion. The problem is the stability of the interferometer during that. So we couldn't run for more than 10 minutes, and we tried. To, and so when you run it for more than 10 minutes, in the partner setting that we have, the room that we have with the kind of temperature stability and all of this, stability of our lasers that we cannot. So um, we tried to do a variety of things. This is the best that. But when you, when you do this template experiment, you do first this ABC setup, then AB setup, then BCF. Yeah? And, and then we randomly chose which one was the second one. Yeah. Is that but, if, but if you exchange them quickly, I mean, you could run for longer time because then it would not matter that your, your setup is the way because, I mean, if you exchange you your, your setup is quickly, then you should run no, it doesn't matter what happens then to do the But if you exchange them quickly, you would probably introduce so much of the noise. Absolutely right. Um, the, 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 this are, they, they probably takes lots of time to, to, uh, to 
fix this arrangement of this bicycle? Um, so moving the mask doesn't take very long. There's all motor that brings it. The problem is that the source of photons that we have is not deterministic. So if you make it on a small amount of time, the fluctuation in the number of photons that comes in is larger with respect to the number of photons that you have because it goes like square root of n. And then so you have a larger error. So we thought about, we did a lot of variation to try to see what is best. And this is the best we could do, which doesn't mean it's the final answer. So my goal and one of our goals of doing this is other people going and do more experiments and kind of push this at the higher level. <coughs> OK. A sec Another error that we saw is that here's a picture of this mask. OK, so we have the slits, which are there. And this is a mask, which goes up and down. And so this is the three-slit part. And you could see the other, uh, the other pieces with only two of the slits. And you can see here bell defect on the mask or kind of imperfection. And this leads to a value of epsilon. So all these things. And it turns out that this one, it took us a, quite some amount of time before we went to image it and realize that this kind of small things is giving us trouble, which in retrospect, we should have done in advance. And, but part of doing experiments at some point, you have to say, we've done enough and here's a value and we ask other people around the world to go and do it much better in a much better way. In fact, I should say, in retrospect, a much more clever way of doing this experiment with three states is to have a different geometry. Thinking about slits, I think about something which like two slits which look like this, and then three slits would be three things like this, and this is, we started and we did a lot of work. And it's only sometime after that we thought that maybe we could have three states <laughs> which would be like this. So now, patterns are a little bit different. You tend to restore the symmetry. And that you have a symmetry. And the second thing is that, more importantly, is that it's easy to plug them by putting a wedge yeah. from three different directions to make this happen. Now, we, and this is such a simple idea. But you lose the intensity, of course, because the pinholes are small. Yeah, or you could make them different size, and again, you have a. Uh, two things that you have to compensate with each other, how big you want, but you still want to block them very well because if light comes in on the side like this, you get so that there's a compromise that you have to go with. This arrangement would have been more clever than what we did, but anyway, it's a good, good enough to have a start of a discussion and talk about uh, Bonjour. Okay, um, here's another experiment, not done with optics, but with nuclear magnetic resonance. So the idea here is that we have um, we have two nuclear spins in four different states, 0, 1, 2, 3, and the 0 corresponds to the slit closed, 1, 2, and 3 corresponds to the slit 1, 2, and 3 being open. And then you can make a superposition of different states. So 0, 0, 0, all the one closed corresponds to having the state 0. Having a 1 open here on the right corresponds to the state here. The one in the middle, a second state, and a third state, two opens correspond to this. They want to be sure that you have the right coefficient in front to be sure that this thing is not get normalized. All the states open is a superposition of one, two, and three. So you can do something which is very similar here. Although I must admit that this is not a fundamental test of quantum mechanics. It's just one that shows that it is consistent with quantum mechanics because developing this implicitly assume that there is a measure of how you can compare how much of zeros and ones that you have. And we do this by using implicit identity quantum mechanics. So we just test that what we do is consistent with quantum mechanics. OK. Turns out that we get values of the kappa, which was a row in the previous transparency, which is very similar to what we got in, in the case of, uh, of the optics case. And then um, the error, we can look, go and look at systematic errors are in the state preparation of the system. And we'll go and look at this. So we've done it with photons. We do this with NMR. If you have your preferred 
quantum information processing system, you can go and test this. Some of them might be better than those two to go and test this at higher accuracy. Okay, and I want to finish with a different way of testing Born rules, but this one is a little bit more explicit, and it came through uh, work from Wojciech Zurek, which has probably come here a few times and gave talks. Uh, I was at Los Alamos, Wojciech was my mentor there, and when I started to work on Born's rule, I sat down one day at a cafe and started to explain what we were doing. He said, oh, that's really interesting. And he was working on this that I'll mention in a few seconds. But I remember one thing that he said to me. He says, you know, if Born's rule fails, everything goes to hell. And I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, probability is, you have either probability is not conserved or you have to modify the Schrodinger equation. You modify the Schrodinger equation, then there's other problem that comes in. There's always some weird things that happen. It's always a challenge. So I remember from this that if Born's rule fails, everything goes to hell. To which I answered to him, with the name I have, Raymond Laflamme, if you change the R for a D, it sounds like démon, which means devil in French, and la flame, the flame. So with the name of devil, the flame, I think I can work on something that might go to hell at some point. Okay, so Zurek has an idea of deriving Born's rule from one of the symmetry of quantum mechanics. And although I won't go into all details, and I refer you to this paper if you want to go into that detail, I'll give you just an idea of how it works. If you look at maximally entangled states of the form 0, 0, plus 1, 1, these states have a really interesting symmetry, which he calls invariance. Environment, uh, environment induced uh, something. I forgot it. Environment, environment, environment invariance. That's it. Environment induced invariance. So here's the really interesting property. If you have two qubits or two spin half particles and you bring them really far apart from each other. And on one of them, you do a unitary transformation, U. You can undo the effect of that operation by acting on the second qubit and restore that state U. So if you do US on this, you get that state here. But by doing a different U in here, you get back to the initial state that you started with. Now, this is weird. Because it tells you that the total system has this property that something can be done here, and something on the other side of the universe can be undone what's happening in here. So, it is surprising. And Zurek says, from this, we can look at prob prob properties of the probability in quantum mechanics. For example, I'll give you one thing. It tells you that the probability of what's happening on one qubit, which is here, cannot be independent, cannot depend on the phase of the quantum state. Why? Because suppose that US is the state, an operation which is phi sigma z on the system S. This is going to bring a phase relative between this part and this part, which will be equal to 2 phi, right? Okay? So there will be a relative phase in front of this, which goes on that form here. But this can be undone by the other system on the other side of the universe. And if you believe that physics and your measurements are always local, Things that happen here cannot depend on the devil on the other side of the, uh, the universe who changes its phase. So this tells you that the probability of getting this part here or this part here cannot depend on that phase, on that system that you are looking at. And this tells you that when you look at the probability in quantum mechanics, it has to be proportional to the absolute value because it cannot depend on that phase. It doesn't yet tell you 
what is the exponent, but it tells you it's the absolute value. He has also an argument which tells you that it has to be the square. And essentially is that the value of 0 and 1 here, they can be flipped also. And then with this, he goes and makes some argument, which is a little bit complicated. And I have about two minutes left, so I'm not going to go through the details. But if you want to know, go there. Essentially, that symmetry implies more true. So in the experiment that we've done with Kevin Rash at IQC, we tested that symmetry. Now, it's not a direct test of Horn's rule, but it's a test of, of that symmetry. And so the idea is simple. We take a laser, create a pair of untangled photons, and then make rotations here and here. And then with these rotations, by making a variety of different rotations, we look at, do we get the same state, or we get a state which is different? Okay? So, Here's the result. Let's look at the one at the top. And what we are measuring here is the fidelity, the probability. We started with a state which was psi plus, okay, one of the belt state. And then we make one rotation on one side, then the rotation on the other side, and then we get the state rho, and then we are measuring what is the overlap between the, fi the final state that we have with the Psi plus. This is a rotation. If we take the rotation around the x axis, y axis, z axis, and this one is the axis which is at the same distance between the x, y, and z diagonal, so kind of in the middle of the drop sphere, kind of pointing straight up. For those who know magic states, is the direction of the magic state. So you can see the line at the top here, well, the one at the bottom is if we do rotation on only one side, and then you can get something which becomes orthogonal. But if we do the rotation on both sides, you can see this is very good, it's a very good approximation near one. Okay? Now let's blow this up here to look how good it is, and this is what you have here. So the axis here is filled in between 0 to 1, and in here it's 0 0.980 to 1. So kind of grow this by kind of a few orders of magnitude. And you see a little bit of fluctuation that comes in there. So there you might have to say, OK, what is the reason for this? And it turns out that we can explain this variation in the fact that we don't have exactly psi plus. So we have psi plus plus a little bit of psi minus. And when you have a superposition of two bell states, then it doesn't obey the symmetry exactly. And you can go and look at this. So there you can see that it's slightly different when we have this. But this epsilon is small enough, but it can explain this amount of variation from one side to the other. I mentioned here this beta, beta charia coefficient is just a classical way of thinking about this probability because you could have pointed out to me that assuming the fidelity here, this, implicitly assume that we have Born's rule. So this is a way of saying it doesn't really depend on assuming that one. Okay, I see time is gone. You've learned a little bit about Born's rule and test of Born's rule. Uh, next type of experiments we can do, and I think Gregor Weiss has started with this, is instead of doing uh, things with slits or with an MR, maybe we can do an experiment just with many paths with a, a, a diffraction pattern, make them face back and go and measure them. And this might be more precise than the way that we are doing. So this is something that uh, Gregory is kind of looking at. So at the end, how, do we, how well do we know Born's rule? So we know that it's pretty good. It's a very good approximation, certainly, to the laws of nature. Maybe it is exact. We don't know. But one of the interesting things that I've learned also thinking about this is the theoretical implication of violating Born's rule. And for quantum computing, it is one which is quite interesting. 
But if you have Born's rule being violated, it turns out that you have many more parameters to describe the state than you have when you have Born's rule. And it turns out that if you have the equivalent of qubits in that system, the amount of information will go up exponentially to describe these new systems, like these post-quantum systems. And we've learned, and Scott Harrison is one of those, showed that if you would have a system which violates Born's rule, then it would be a new part in the hierarchy of computing devices. That you would have classical computers at the bottom, quantum computers who can solve some problem exponentially faster than classical computer, and these new systems which violate Born's rule can solve problem exponentially faster than the quantum computing one. So, from a theoretical point of view, it has some kind of interest as a hierarchy of thinking about the future. There are some experiments related to this and kind of trying to show, are these terms there? I hope they are, because for the young people here, that will be a mind of new interesting theories that we can develop to try to experiment this. And so that's something for the future. Thank you very much. Born's rule suggests some kind of averaging. And of course, what comes to mind is time averaging. So to see the violations, perhaps it would require going more precisely into the time development of the system. This is like the homodyning that yeah. we use to make a measurement. And the theoretical idea behind this is the following. Take an electron. Electron's wave function oscillates extremely rapidly. Yeah. And these oscillations are never seen. Schrodinger equations, just the envelope, when we disregard the oscillations of the electron due to its rest mass, which is extremely fast. And Born's rule might be true because of this time averaging. If one can really go beyond the so kind of time. Logic. <coughs> so the or if one can control yeah. the phase of the wave function at the much deeper level. So your then suggestion is to would be to redo this experiments, but to do longer amount of time, but look at the development as a function of time to see what is the fluctuation. Yes, for, with photons, of course, we are in a much better position yeah, because, because you know, photons do not have the rest mass. Yeah. And therefore, the only thing to do is to see whether the oscillations yeah. of the wave function of the photon, which are in yeah. Yeah. just photons, yeah. just uh, feasible to see, yeah. could make the difference. Yeah, interesting, interesting suggestion. I should have mentioned there is also some experiment uh, that people are thinking to do using neutron interferometry to test, again, three slits. We can do very good interferometers with neutrons. And so that's a direction where, indeed, you have things which are slit much faster. And this is how the nonlinearity was ruled out by. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and pushing it in the different direction. So yes, I they were. Are you more questions? So, so I understand, is it, is it obvious? I mean, is it direct connection and the violation of Born's rule and, for example, nonlinear Mechanics. Yeah. I mean, is it one-to-one -one correspondence, or you can have linear quantum mechanics and still violate Born's rule? Well, if you have linear quantum mechanics and you want to preserve the probability, well, the Schrodinger equation yeah, the preserve probability. Yeah, exactly. So there is a relationship between between the two. Um, now, finding the correspondence exactly, we did make some simulation at some point of nonlinear quantum mechanics and see what we would see in there. But my co-authors had some challenges of how we normalize this wave function and all this. Then at the end, we decided not to go further. But if somebody has a theory with some nonlinearity of quantum mechanics in some form, then I'm interested because we can see what are the limits of these parameters in there. I had one, but that was ruled out by yeah. people yeah. in the yeah. 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 <laughs> So At least they push push this yeah, yeah, exactly to a parameter which is extremely small yeah, and right. yeah, which is quite interesting. That what is 
why is quantum mechanics in, in that way? And my gut's feeling, which changes from day to day because things well, that we don't know should be different. Maybe because we are looking for a quotation, violation of a quantum mechanics in a completely wrong way. I, I, want to, I want to tell that uh, the Newton's mechanics was not violated quotation by looking on the fact that it fails to predict the motion of a car. Yeah. It, was, it was violated by a completely different part of physics when, when, when it comes in contact with the Newton mechanics. So I think uh, it can rest assured that these kinds of experiments will hardly ever had the chance of showing that what the mechanics we know is not good. However, there is a couple it's also obvious that the quantum mechanics is not the final science. Yeah. There will be something yeah. else, and that, that's also very yeah. obvious. But we are just looking for this for this new science in the wrong way. That's and, and in fact, this is exactly what motivated me looking at yeah. this part because nobody had looked at well, there yeah, was the no, nonlinear exactly, exactly, were there, but this was a little bit this different. Was exactly. yeah, I, I, said, I have a technical okay. question. Did anybody look at the experiments of the kind of recent experiments? by electron diffraction of the molecules. I mean, we have a lot of molecules which can be three slits, sort of. I mean, the linear three yeah. atom molecules. I mean, and actually, because the, nothing yeah, would right. change yeah. if you would put the four slits in the organic molecules that are four atoms.